Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, or Isaiah, if you're from elsewhere. If you're using one of the Bibles under the seats nearby, the text we'll be looking at is Isaiah 49, and it's on page 609 in those Bibles. And if you're new to our church family, we take this time to usually just work through a portion of Scripture. It could be a couple verses. It could be a few uh, paragraphs. We believe this is God's very Word to us. And so we gather together to hear Him speak to us through His Word, and His Spirit um, brings us to our minds and hearts. So uh, we prioritize hearing His Word and responding to it together. So that's what we're doing here. Why don't we pray before we begin? Our Father, we thank You for making us Your dwelling place in this new temple. We pray now that You would fill us with Your Spirit and turn our hearts to see Your beauty in Jesus and have great joy in the Spirit. Amen. Well, we are in the midst of a sermon series called People for the World. And we're seeing that God has always made His people to be a people for the world. He saves us and He sends us to spread His salvation. So our purpose as a church, the way we put it, is to glorify God by being and making disciples of Jesus who are a community of worshipers on mission. So we ultimately want to glorify God, and the way we do that is by being and making disciples of Jesus. So a disciple of Jesus is someone who learns from Jesus to become like Jesus. We follow Him wherever He goes in all of life. And the three words here that explain what discipleship looks like are worship, community, and mission. So we learn to worship God and honor Him in all of life and value Him above all things. We don't do this just by ourselves, though. God always saves people in and for community. And so we're a church family united together in love. And we also live not just for ourselves or even our church family, but for the sake of others to come to know and love Jesus. So, we are for the world. Uh, Individual Christians are to be for the world. We as a church are to be for the world. We want to show and share the love of Christ. And so, we've been spending these first few weeks in this series in the Old Testament. Partly, this is to show that the mission of God's people did not begin post-Jesus' resurrection and the New Testament. God always saves His people for the sake of spreading His blessing and salvation to others. And so, this morning we're going to look at Isaiah 49 and the first 13 verses. This text gives us a picture of all nations, people from all nations, listening to Jesus. They listen to Him speak about His identity and His mission, and then they're called to join all creation in this explosion of joyful singing. So, they, they listen to Jesus, and then what they hear makes them sing for joy. Now, wouldn't that be amazing to see? For the whole world to stop and listen to Jesus, to hear of who He is and why He came, and then to erupt with joy and singing. Well, in part, it is happening. Jesus has come He has spoken of His identity and His mission, and as His message spreads, people hear His voice and respond with joy. This morning is evidence of this. We are joining in and participating in what's been going on for 2,000 years and spreading wider and wider across the planet of people hearing the voice of Jesus and then responding with joyful singing. But there are still many people and language groups who have not yet heard the message of Jesus, and so Jesus calls us to show and share that love that they might join the song. So, Isaiah 49 shows us that Jesus came to restore Israel and spread salvation to the nations, and He gives us this role of spreading that salvation as well. So, let's read Isaiah 49, the first 13 verses here. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. 
From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. Here's what the Lord says to the servant. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who's faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Verse 8, thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I've answered you. In a day of salvation, I've helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them, for he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I'll make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. So this is a conversation between God the Father and Jesus, the servant. And through this dialogue, we learn about Jesus' identity, his vocation, his success, and the fitting response to all of this. So let's walk through this text uh, and see this together. So first, the identity of the servant. So Isaiah 49 opens with this servant speaking to the whole world. He gives a command to the whole world to listen. So verse 1, you can read again with me. He says, listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. So coastlands, peoples from afar, these are just different ways of referring to nations, all nations. Throughout Isaiah, he uses phrase like, phrases like this to refer to all people groups, all language groups, the ends of the earth, every corner of the globe. So this is a global message. And it's a worldwide command for people to stop what they're doing and listen to the one who's speaking. And who is this one who's speaking called the servant? Who has the right to tell you and me and everyone everywhere to listen to him? Well, some think the servant is the nation of Israel. He's called Israel in this text, so that makes sense. But this can't be the nation of Israel because verses 5 and 6 say that this servant has a ministry to Israel. So he's called Israel, but he's distinct from the nation of Israel. He's a singular Israelite. And since he's a singular Israelite, some think that the one speaking as the servant is the prophet Isaiah. So prophets call people to listen, so that makes sense. But this servant, you notice, has a greater authority and greater mission than any prophet. So prophets say, listen to what God says. But this one, this servant, saying, listen to me. Prophets don't say that. And he's saying to the whole world, this is someone greater than a prophet. So who's the servant? Well, he's one person called Israel, and he has the authority to tell everyone everywhere to listen. Who is he? Well, the context fills it out a bit. This larger section of Isaiah unfolds what we can call the story of the servant. There are several texts that uh, have 
come to be known as the servant songs because they're descriptions of this servant, and then the result is singing. So, these texts tell a story. So, the first one is Isaiah 42. So, if you're open to 49, you can just flip back a couple pages. God calls the people of Israel His servant there. It refers to the nation of Israel. God says to this servant Israel in Isaiah 42, verses 6 to 7, I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from prison those who sit in darkness. So Israel was always meant to be God's servant to the world and a light to to the nations. And Isaiah 42 describes Israel as a nation in this ideal way. It's really the vision of Israel that we've been looking at in this series so far in the past couple messages. In Exodus 19, God called Israel a kingdom of priests. So they were to serve as priests in the world. They would attract the nations to God. And then we saw in Deuteronomy 4 last Sunday that God gave Israel His laws to help them be this light. God's law would lead them to live out a life of love and wisdom and justice. And the nations were to say, we have never seen anything like this. There's no nation or no religion with a God so near and rules so good. So Israel would have this moral magnetism drawing the nations to God. Israel was to be a people for the world, showing and sharing the love of God. But the whole story of Israel shows that they essentially and repeatedly failed at this mission. And that's what Isaiah shows us next. After introducing this ideal servant Israel in chapter 42, God says they failed. So in chapter 42 still, but verse 19, he says to this servant Israel, who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger whom I send? So he said that he was going to magnify his law through them, but they didn't keep it. And so, over these chapters, he shows just how much Israel's failed and that they're in spiritual blindness. They were supposed to set prisoners free, but they're in spiritual prison. They were supposed to open the eyes of the blind, but they're blind. And so, by the time you get to chapter 48, 48 opens and calls these people Israel, but says only in name. They claim to know God, but not in truth. And so, now we come to Isaiah 49, and we hear of one singular servant, a new and a true Israel, an Israelite who will represent and embody the ideal Israel in himself. He'll live the life they failed to live. Israel's failed, and so God is going to raise up a perfect substitute Israel. He will be the faithful and true Israel and therefore really the faithful and true human, because that's what Israel was showing the world. This is what it means to live as we were always meant to live. Israel's like a new Adam, and they failed. And so now there's going to be a true human, a true Israel who will do it. And as the servant songs go on, we find out that this servant will also die as a perfect sacrifice. He'll take the judgment of the people upon himself, and he'll rise, and his message will spread to the end of the earth, inviting all to trust the Lord and to sing for joy. So Israel was given this promise in Isaiah 49 that there would be a true and better Israel, a singular faithful one who would come. And then 700 years later, he came. This is, of course, Jesus. Jesus often referred to these texts and these servant texts to explain who he was and why he came. So the servant describes himself in this text then. So he tells of his calling in verse 1. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. So Jesus came, and when he was still in his mother's womb, he was named. The angel said to call him Jesus. He speaks of his preparation in verse 2. The servant speaking of Yahweh God, the Lord, said, He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of His hand, He hid me. He made me like a polished arrow. In His quiver, He hid me away. So, this servant Jesus was prepared like a polished arrow, carefully crafted for His mission, a mission of using words as well as as His mouth as a sword. And then He was hid away until He was ready to be unleashed. 
And Jesus spent 30 years before he began his ministry. He tells us his identity in verse, thir- in verse 3. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So Jesus is saying that the Father will call him Israel, and he will be glorified in him. So God will be glorified through this servant. The word for glory here refers most often to beauty. Israel was supposed to show the beauty of God. People were supposed to see the way they live together and think, this is beautiful. This is how humans are supposed to live together. What must their God be like as he reveals his character in his good ways and it's lived out like this? Since Israel failed, God promised to raise up a singular, faithful, and true Israel. And Jesus came as this true Israel who would glorify God. God would show his beauty through Jesus. Jesus is the radiance of of the invisible God. The Gospel of John shows how this was on Jesus' mind. He began his great prayer in John 17, just before he died, this way. Father, another conversation now between the servant and the Father. Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Jesus often quoted and echoed these texts from Isaiah as ways of explaining himself to people. So this is how we're supposed to think of Jesus. It's not just his death that matters for us. It's his life. It's his character. It's his identity. He came to be the true and faithful human being and Israel. He came to live the truly good and truly beautiful and perfect life, the only one that's ever been lived. So this is one way that all the themes of the Old Testament move along and then converge in Jesus. Adam failed, Noah failed, Abraham failed, Israel failed, David failed, prophets failed, priests failed, kings failed, they all failed. And Jesus came to be the true servant Israel. He is the one in whom this all comes together. He came to be the true Adam, true Noah, Israel, David, prophet, priest, king, and so forth. And this was planned by the Father from the foundation of the world. It was revealed through Isaiah 700 years before Jesus came, and then Jesus came to fulfill it all for us. So this is the first thing that this servant wants the world to know. Nations, all peoples far away, listen to me. And then he starts telling his story about who he is and what his purpose is. He's saying, listen to me. I've come to live the life you have all failed to live. And the people of Israel have failed to live. I'm here to do it perfectly. So that's the identity of the servant. And then second, we see the vocation of the servant. So this is verses 4 and 6, 4 to 6. Fascinating glimpse into the humanity of Jesus here. So this servant recounts his response of weariness and trust in God the Father. So God said, he's recounting what God had said to him, you will be this true Israel. I will be glorified through you. But then the servant, as he recounts, this is what God told him, he responds like this in verse 4. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. He's weary His work seems fruitless. He feels like he's giving his life and he's not seeing results. Have you ever felt like that? Maybe you've served for a long time in some way and no one notices or appreciates it. Or you're parenting and you're loving your kids and they're not changing and they're not appreciative and they're rejecting you. Or you've been pouring into your marriage and it doesn't seem to you to be getting any better. Or you're serving as an elder or a deacon or a staff member or a ministry leader. You're doing so much. And sometimes you feel like, I just don't see any fruit from this. I'm so weary and nothing seems to be happening. Is it worth it? You're serving in your vocation. You've committed your life to train and then do this well. And then you're wondering, is anything coming of all that I've put in? 
Jesus understands. This servant has felt weariness. We see this in Jesus' ministry, all of his efforts and work and service. And what happened? Very often he's serving and just nobody's believing. And even his disciples don't get it. And then in the end, he's rejected by his people and he's abandoned by his friends. One of his best friends denying him just feet away. But notice he trusts his father for the outcome. He's not sinning here. He says, yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense, my, my reward, the, the fruit that I want is from my God. So this is the heart of the text. He says how God responded then to his discouragement. He honors him, and then he gives, God gives this servant the vo- this vocation and mission in verse 6. So God says to the servant, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to rise, raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now, I don't want to overstate things here, but this is one of the most important verses in the Bible for understanding Jesus and the church's mission. It's not often appreciated, though. This shows two stages in Jesus' mission, this mission of this servant Jesus. The first stage here is restoring a remnant in Israel. So this servant is called Israel, right? And then he'll also restore Israel. Because remember, the nation of Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations to open spiritually blind eyes, but they're spiritually blind, so Israel needs to be saved first. And so this servant is going to first restore Israel. He'll bring them spiritual salvation, at least a remnant of them. It talks about the the preserved in Israel. So he's going to restore Israelites bringing them spiritual salvation. And then the second stage, he'll be be a light to the nations. And I love how verse 6 puts it. God says, it is too light a thing that you should restore Israel. I'll make you as a light for the nations. So in his weariness, seeing a lack of fruit in some sense, the father says, you're not only going to restore Israelites, you're going to be a light to the nations. Restoring Israel is not enough. Jesus' mission and work are worth more than that. It's worth more than Israel. It's worth all nations. Israel's not enough. America's not enough. Your family's not enough. China's not enough. Salvation will reach to all the ends of the earth. So the reward for Jesus' work will be a global people. This is what Israel was supposed to do all along. So the servant will restore Israel and then carry out Israel's vocation to be a light to the nations. But it will work this time because this vocation calling is placed on the shoulders of Jesus. And this is exactly what Jesus did. He followed two stages in his ministry. In fact, a lot of confusion of many of the things Jesus was saying and doing in his ministry get cleared up when you realize he was fulfilling this pattern that Isaiah said would be two phases and stages. So he first came to bring Israelites out of spiritual darkness. And then after that, to send his salvation to the ends of the earth. So maybe you've wondered why Jesus was so focused on Israel during his ministry. And it was because he, he was sent to restore Israelites first. And even then, though, we see that he was reaching the nations, and he talks about sending to the nations, and Gentiles are coming to faith in his ministry, but the main focus is reaching and restoring Israelites. And then after his resurrection, he says, go to the nations. It's time now. Even then, though, he didn't say skip over Israel and go to the nations. He said start in Jerusalem. And then go to the surrounding areas, Samaria and Judea, and then go to all the nations. So this, by the way, is why it's not quite right to say that when Jesus says, you know, take the gospel out there beginning in Jerusalem and then the areas around and the ends of the earth, it's not quite right to say that that's kind of a model or a paradigm for our individual or local church callings. Because this isn't the idea of him saying, just start with your hometown and then reach out a little further and then go a little further out from all of that. This was a prophetic fulfillment. 
It would start with Israel and the center of Israel and Jerusalem, and then let the light shine outward from there. So Jerusalem and Israel weren't the starting point because it was the disciples' homeland. It was the starting point because of Isaiah 49. The plan was to start with Israel and then go to the nation. So Zionsville is not, you know, our Jerusalem. Zionsville is part of the nations, part of the peoples far away in this text, part of the ends of the earth. We're here. We are in the ends of the earth to spread the gospel here. And the gospel needs to spread further because there are ends of the earth where the gospel has not yet come. And there are not local churches like there are in the Indianapolis area. And so we continue to fulfill this plan. So the servant has announced his identity to the world. And then he shared his vocation to restore Israel and then the nations. And then now in verses 7 to 12, we see the success of the servant. So God speaks to him again to encourage him. The servant is weary, and now we are going to see he's despised and rejected. And God encourages him by telling him of his coming success. Not only will it be a global ministry and mission, but it will result in global worship of God. So God says that even Gentile kings will worship because of his work. This is verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one, the servant, deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. So that Jesus experienced that. Here's what God the Father says to him. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who's faithful, the Holy One of Israel who's chosen you. As the gospel spreads, it will reach even those with power that will come to acknowledge Jesus as King. And that's happened over history. Uh, and one day, those who have not repented and bowed down to Him will be forced to, as every knee will bow to the Lord Jesus. So the servant's going to be rejected and despised, but one day that'll change. Even leaders will bow down to Him. And from here, God says that people from all over will come home to God. And so this all leads to the response to the servant in verse 13. So this started with listening. It ends with singing. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. So this is a picture of the power of God's grace. This is what the gospel does for people. God did not come to his people and say, listen, you failed. Here's what you need to do. You need to stop failing. You need to get your act together. You need to be a light to the nations and sing about it. Um, no, he says, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to listen to what I'm going to do. And then in between that listening, God says what he's going to do through this servant. And then the result is you sing about it. That's grace. God shows up to a world who's failed, and he says, listen to me. I'm going to do what you failed to do. I'm going to die in your place and rise again, and I'm going to be a light to the nations. Let's sing about it. Only the gospel does that. Only a message of grace does that. You listen and you hear the story of Jesus and how he works out salvation, and then you receive it and you sing. So, have you trusted this Jesus? He had this plan of salvation in mind from eternity past. He says to all in this text, listen to me. And he's told you who he is and what he's done. He's told you that he came as this true servant to live the perfect life that Israel, Adam, humanity, you, all of us have failed to live. He has gone through weariness and discouragement to give his life. And then on the cross, he bears our sins, and he's risen again, and now he's spreading the light of salvation to the nations, and that light has traveled around the globe for almost 2,000 years, and it's landed here, and it's shining on you right now. So if you've not yet received Jesus you're invited to now. Come to Him and receive His grace and follow Him and sing to Him. So how should we all respond to this? 
Well, the main question I want to consider here in the last couple minutes is, do you realize that you, if you have received this salvation, if Jesus is your king, that you have an eternally significant global purpose for your life? Do you realize that? If you are a Christian, you do not have a purposeless life. You may not be living according to your purpose, but it is there for you to embrace and live out, to live as a light to the nations, to show and to share the love of Christ. So this text and how it's fulfilled in Jesus gives us a mini theology of the mission of the church. It answers a number of questions. Here's five of them, and then we'll be done. First, what is the story of mission? Well, the story runs through the whole Bible. Israel was called to be a servant and a light to the nations. They failed. Jesus came to do it perfectly. But here's what also we find. He doesn't just save people. He restores them to this failed purpose. Jesus is the true Israel, but all of those who trust in Him become united to Him and become part of this new and true Israel, both Israelites and non-Israelites. All together are part of the true Israel because Jesus is the true Israel. And we're restored to the calling of Israel. We're renewed to be a light to the nations. And now Jesus, the risen Christ, spreads his salvation and shines his light as the servant through you and through me as his body. So here's what I'm saying. Jesus is Israel. And if you are a Christian, you are now part of this new and true Israel, and therefore you are restored to your calling, the calling that was really given to Adam to spread God's glory in the world. You are restored to this calling to serve the world and be a light to the nations. You know, the Apostle Paul did something very peculiar with the text that we are looking at. He quotes it at one point, and from other things he says, he clearly knows that Isaiah 49 is about Jesus. Um, it's clearly referring to Jesus in many ways, but there's one point where Paul, it's in Acts chapter 13, it's verse 47, he quotes this text, and he says that it's referring to him, Paul and Barnabas, his buddy. Well, that's interesting. Um, so, Paul's on his missionary journey, and he goes to these cities, and he goes to the Jewish people first and then to Gentiles. And so he's in one of these cities going to the Jewish people, and they start rejecting him, especially out of jealousy just because they see Gentiles, non-Jewish people, interested. And he quotes Isaiah 49, verse 6, to the Jews who are rejecting. He says this, "'The Lord has commanded us, saying, "'I have made you a light for the Gentiles, "'that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth.'" So it seems like he is applying this to himself. How can he do that? Well, it's because he knows that the risen Lord Jesus is the true servant and light to the nations. And now all who trust in him are united to him to carry out this vocation. Jesus reaches the nations through him. So when you become a Christian, you're now part of Jesus' mission to spread light to the nations. So Jesus and the disciples focused first on restoring any Israelite who would listen and believe. This is how the prophecies of the restoration of Israel were restored. And we see that in the beginning of the book of Acts. It is, is, they are Israelites who are restored first and brought into Jesus and faith in Jesus. And then outward from there, those who are not Israelites brought in to join Jesus as the true Israel. So that's the story of mission. Second, what's the means of mission? How does the gospel spread? Well, Jesus uses his church to spread his love. The church is made up of all who trust Jesus. They're from any socioeconomic status, any ethnicity, any cultural background, any age, and the church is then continuing the mission of Jesus in the world to be a light to the nation. So every Christian is part of this plan. Every Christian is part of the purpose to show and share the love of Christ. Third question, what's the reach of the mission? Where is the gospel to spread? Everywhere. It started in Jerusalem, went to Samaria and Judea, where the, where the northern and southern tribes were originally there, and then outward from there to the nations. 
And now it's spread to Zionsville, and it's spread to many, many nations and language groups. And there's more work to be done right here. And so, again, this isn't our Jerusalem. This is part of the ends of the earth where the gospel needs to keep spreading and shining. And so the gospel is here, but there's many people in our communities and in our culture who don't have any idea who the real Jesus is. They've heard about him, and they reject him, but the Jesus they reject is a version of Jesus that they've heard, or what's in their head about Jesus, and it's not the real Jesus. Jesus is way more beautiful than most people have in mind as they reject him. And so we want to keep reintroducing people to the real Jesus, to our friends, to our family, to our neighbors, in ministries if you serve. But the gospel also needs to keep spreading to more nations. There still are many unreached people groups, unengaged people groups, language groups that don't have the Bible in their language, places that don't have churches among them. There are places where people are born, they live, and they die, and they'll never meet a Christian. And they don't have access an opportunity to hear about Jesus. And so this is why we as a church are committed to global missions as a church and also making sure that we are reaching the least reached peoples. One of our values is reaching the unreached and least reached. Fourth, what's the goal of mission? Right here in verse 13, being liberated by the grace of God, forgiven and freed, so that we glorify God through singing, a life of singing and literal singing with gratefulness. So, God would be beautified through Jesus and His church. So we're to put the beauty of God on display as we live a life of love together and bring the message of Jesus to others so that it results in singing. And then finally, what's the practice of mission? How do we do this? Well, we show and share the love of Christ. We'll get more practical in a few, the next few weeks here, but at the heart of this is loving people well in introducing them to the very source of love the God of love, befriending people, caring about them, being hospitable, praying for people to come to know Jesus, inviting them to meet Christian friends of yours around a meal, giving them Bibles, encouraging them to read the Gospels, asking what questions they have about Jesus, sharing stories about Jesus from the Gospels, sharing your story of how God opened your eyes and changed you and praying, and giving, and sending, and going to send the gospel to language groups and people groups that need the light of Christ. So, this is the message of the servant. He says to everyone, listen, and then we hear about him, and then he says, sing. So, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful infinitely wise and wonderful plan of rescue and restoration through your Son and by your Spirit's power. Thank you that we get to participate in this. Thank you that you have called us to yourself. Thank you that you entrust this great mission to us to be a light to the nations. Thank you that you've shined that light here and that we get to shine it outward. So we pray that you would let us be a bright light in our community and to those who are in darkness and need to know you, and we pray that you would work powerfully in the ministries of the men and women and boys and girls in this room, even this week, even this very afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen.